ekpco.com.au or give us a call today on 03 9023 9370. Fast, proactive, personal. That's DKP and Co. Chartered Accountants. You're listening to the State of Our Football Nation on FNR. Time of the week and uh, on cue, the weather in Melbourne has decidedly uh, just decided it's not the sort of weather that anyone would play football in. It is bucketing down uh, and that's now for the second day in a row. So if you're anywhere but in Victoria, you're probably smiling. If you're in Melbourne, you're going, please let us out. <laughs> Turn the turn the taps off. Uh, Josh Parrish joins me as usual for se- uh, what, what we call Sufin or State of Our Football Nation. How are you? I'm doing well, George. Uh, managed to avoid the downpour. Uh, can't be said the same for our producer, Pakur, out there, who's uh, currently drying off. That's right. We've got her in the uh, high-speed fan, and she's just starting to feel a little, more, little bit more relaxed than we imagined. Oh, listen, uh, some f- fantastic football already we've seen this week. Some more exciting stuff coming up on the weekend. You've got the Doherty Cup mm. uh, Sunday. And who's turning up? Who's playing? It's Avondale versus Hume City. Okay, Hume City, fresh from its uh, very, very strong game against Melbourne City last night mm-hmm. in the FFA Cup. Uh, what did you make of that game? I, I thought they gave him a real test. I thought all the games last night, uh, based on what I've seen, of course, I was in here doing the green room for That's part right. of that, but yeah. uh, it looked like we came as close as we have this tournament to a cup set and just fell short. I mean, victory pushed all the way. I thought Hume City gave a good account of themselves and, and the Mariners, you know, uh, against Wollongong was a tight one as well. Yeah, we need to remind people yet again that the teams that are in the lower tiers have mm. not been... Uh, in a competitive setting for a yeah. number of weeks. And uh, the COVID situation, of course, the, the pandemic, uh, really disrupted the FFA Cup programming. I, we, I remember speaking to Channel 10 very early on, just before they had anointed themselves as the, the new broadcaster to take, a, to take the game to a whole new era. And they were saying, our hands are you know, tied. We really can't do this. We can't do that. We can't plan ahead because of the COVID situation. And that, I'm sure, has really affected a lot of the players. If you're not playing regularly in a competitive setting, it makes it extraordinarily difficult to be competitive eh? and sharp. Mm. And that's the one thing we've seen throughout those very tight games where they, the players missed those golden moments. You can't really blame them. And it's going to be a great test this Sunday of rest versus rust with Hume Ooh. City in action a few times in the Cup and Avondale having to uh, accept the bye <laughs> gratefully from uh, Devonport and progress automatically through the next yes. stage of the FA Cup. They will be turning out, although uh, these players haven't been in action for a long time, with, I'm told, a fully fit and unchanged squad from the MPL Victoria season, whereas Hume City, many, many new faces, uh, some of them very dangerous, including Noel Bernardo, who set the league alight this campaign, the Argentinian. So it'll be very interesting to see what transpires. Look, we've got some terrific guests uh, on State of Our Football Nation and it's only fitting that we start with a George. In fact, a Georgia. Her name is Georgia Yeomandale. She's part of the, the, uh, the Network 10 CBS Paramount Plus uh, uh, commentary team. Tara Rushton, of course, is the, uh, the host with the most. Uh, but the person they like to go to to get a, a sense of what's happening in the game is that former fighting midfielder uh, from the Western Sydney Wanderers. Uh, Georgia, are, are you on the line there? I am. Hello, boys. Uh, How are you? Thank you for finding the time to, to catch up with us, especially in a week where you've had already so much to do <laughs> and so much football to watch. Uh, let's talk about the Matildas before we go any further. What did you make of the game? Yeah, look, I think that there are positives to take from it, but as a whole, I, I was quite disappointed, um, to be completely honest. I think that the performance wasn't up to the standard that we're used to seeing our Matildas playing at. And although we did have quite a few young players um, making their way in the squad, I just I, I think that there was a little something missing. Um, but, you know, you, you've got to give it to them in the second game. We saw that never-say-die attitude from the Matildas and they managed to get a draw from the world number ones in the USA. So um, I think there's positives and, and a lot of learnings to take from mm. those two games. 
Uh, honesty is always the best policy. Uh, Josh and I have been talking about who's actually picking the team right this minute because I'm, I'm sure Tony has, has got a, a, the other added dilemma of trying to find out, you know, all those, uh, the, that wonderful cast that he's got. Uh, he doesn't see them every week. Unlike ha being a coach, for example, of a W League side or an uh, A League women's side where you see them each and every week, you know their strengths, you know their weaknesses, you know their shortcomings. In the national squad, it's infinitely more difficult. Now, you've played five times for the Matildas. Uh, you know what some of the challenges are and how difficult it is to make that step from playing um, in, the, in, the, in the elite leagues of, of, uh, of Australia and then having to step up and play international football. You might give us a sense of your thinking. Yeah, look, it is really difficult. Firstly, I'll touch on um, the, the Tony Gustafsson. I think that he's definitely got a keen eye on all the players in their dom domestic leagues, whether that's in Australia or abroad. Um, but it is a really tough thing to, to step up into that national team. And although players may be very good at domestic level and especially within Australia, international football is a totally different game in terms of the speed of the game, the physicality and the speed in which you have to make decisions. And I think that that's where we see some players fall short is they can be absolute standout superstars in, in the A-League women's and, and then they try and play international football and it's, they're just not quite up to scratch. Um, so I think that although, you know, he's keeping a close eye on players domestically, it's once they come into that international environment, whether it's into a training camp and training amongst the rest of the Matildas, um, that's when they, they can really be tested and we find out how far they really can go, where's their, where's their ceiling in, t in terms of their uh, football and also just for the young players that are being called up into the camp. It's, it's a huge uh, task for them to step up and they'll relish in the opportunity that they've been given and be able to take that back to club land and, and increase the, the quality in the league here too. Georgia, it's Josh here. Uh I see this lineup and I look at a lot of square pegs in round holes and players being asked to fill in in unfamiliar positions. And that's not uh, an unfamiliar situation for the Matildas over the past few years, particularly the defensive midfield slot. We've never found an answer. Depth at centre back, never quite found an answer. And then you get these flow on effects where some of the specialists, like Steph Catley, uh, who's one of the world's best fullbacks, being asked to play in the middle, mm. uh, leaves a spot for uh, Tamika Yallop, who I've never seen her play left back in her life, uh, turning out there against the USA. Uh, what do you make of these, uh, these positional shifts? Is it a matter of getting the 11 best players on the park at the same time, whatever their positions are? Or is there a, a balance that Gustafsson has to strike? Yeah, look, I think you raise a really good point and it, it has been an issue over sort of the last five to ten years of we don't have depth in the squad. We we have a starting 11 who can compete with anyone in the world, uh, but in a lot of key positions, we don't have players to fill in and we really have seen that over the last two years in that central mid defensive midfield position, losing Elise Callon Knight to an ACL Um then we've tried to improvise with Emily Van Egmond, who has done a great job in terms of uh, setting the tone of the game and making sure that, um, you know, we're, we're settled through that midfield position, but it's not a natural position mm. for her and she doesn't provide the same link that link as Elise Keller Knight. And then central defenders, obviously, um, having a, a game against world number one where you two, like, first pick centre-backs in... Claire Polkinghorne and Alana Kennedy are both unavailable. Um, it just really highlighted that uh, the lack of depth in that position. Um, and I think that when it came to the second game, Tony Gustafson was saying, OK, well, let's put our, our best 11 players on the field and, and see how we, um, how we go because he wanted to make sure that we were still competing um, and we were still seen as uh, a winning team, I suppose, globally. Mm. But whether that solves our problems going forward, I don't think so. Um, I think the search for players to fill in those positions is is definitely still on, and um, he'll he'll be looking across all uh, leagues globally for Australian players who can fill in those positions leading into the Asian Cup next year, and then the World Cup in 2023.
you mentioned Elise Kellen Knight there, who's the the absence that we've never made up for. And I, I was almost reaching for the sick bag reading uh, some of the injury strife that she's gone through in the multiple surgeries and yeah. having nerves removed and so forth. Um, but do you see any players who could play that role and, and could, you know, at least uh, imitate some of what she can do? We saw Claire Wheeler uh, have a cameo off the bench, and yes, it was very short, but I thought very impactful and, and winning the ball mm. led to Australia's goal. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. I, I'm i kind of um, baffled as to why she hasn't been given more of an opportunity given her dominance in the, in the A-League women's uh, last season for Sydney FC and then her ability to step up into the national team and just flourish. We saw um, great passages from her in the Brazil games as well, in the limited minutes that she got. Um, she actually won a ball deep and, and created a counter-attacking opportunity that we scored off, and then it was almost a mirror image thing in the second game against the US where she's the one on the field that, that is that link between the defence and attack, um, why she hasn't been given a bigger opportunity to play at international level, I, I don't know. Um, but for me, I think that she's a clear answer at this point um, for a replacement of Elise Kellon Knight. It's always exciting when you see players who can impress and make an impact, whatever they're doing. Uh, one player who has done it almost from the first time I saw her play was is Mary Fowler. Uh, the only question I have, and it's not a criticism, it's just an observation, I'd love to see her do a little bit more. You might remember um, that break just after half time where uh, Sam has made a tremendous run forward and just behind, just behind, you could see Mary trailing. Um, there was an option there. If she'd just stepped up a little bit more, she would have been in the prime position to take a, re a return pass. But again, um, very hard to read her mind. Her vision, more often than not, is astounding. It really is world class. When Mary decides to, to pick a player mm. 30, 40 yards up, well, it's almost stinge perfect. And that is that is something you just can't train. That's, yeah, she, that's just natural. She is, an, she is a, a superstar, um, and it's been so exciting to see her flourish over the last couple of years. But I totally agree with you. I think that you know, if we were to criticise Mary, it's that we want more, and yeah. that's because we can see what she can <laughs> do. Um, and I think, if anything. Uh, you know, she disappears in games at times yeah. and, and doesn't get on the ball. And we saw that a lot in the first game against the US. Um, I think in the first half, she only got four or five touches on the ball. So mm. a cent central midfielder, that's just not acceptable. So mm. once we see her get on the ball, it opens everything up. And, and she's an 18-year-old, <laughs> is so critical yeah. in this... Um, national team and, and that's kind of like amazing in terms of her ability uh, but it's also a lot of pressure on her shoulders and it's now how does she grow into that role and and you know build on that and become more consistent in her game. You know it's 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 unfair of us but we want her to take the game by the scruff of the neck and impose herself don't we? It's almost <laughs> yeah. and I'm wondering how you're feeling you're sitting next to Harps and Harp's about seven foot tall, and you're sitting there trying to inch your way closer, saying, come on, give me some room. Um, you, you, you know that she's got the talent. It, will the penny drop? Do you, do you see that maturity? You know, you've watched her an awful lot. I, I just get... We, we see her only in these international matches, and I think her maturation has been seriously exciting. Are you seeing that as well? Can you see a moment when... Let, let's, let's, get, let's dream for a minute... Uh, opening round of the Women's World Cup 2023, and she's just picking and taking uh, the, the opposition, you know, apart. Yeah, I I definitely see that in Mary's future, and all you need to look at is her short international career and pre-Olympics. Uh, there was a game against Germany where she's turned the ball over. Um, has kind of dropped her head and they've gone up the other end, counter-attacked and scored and we were kind of sitting there going, OK, well, maybe she's not ready for international football. Look where she's at now. She's mm -hmm. one of the first picks in the team. So that's a growth over just, you know... Months. 10 months, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, so we've got 18 months now to get her in prime form for the Women's World Cup. She's playing 
domestically in France. So um, I can just see her continuing to flourish and she's going to be one to watch when it comes to the World Cup here in Australia and teams are going to be frightened and so they should be. <laughs> well, let's return to the, the question of centre-backs, which no one seems to have a clear answer for. Uh, Courtney Nevin got some minutes over these two games. Jessica Nash with the baptism mm. of fire. And, mm. you know, uh, you never want a, a debut to start like it did for her, but uh, 17 years of age, we'll, we'll forgive her. Given that we're 18 months out from a World Cup on home soil, do you think... Uh, blooding these young centre-backs is... Do we have enough time for this? Or should we be maybe returning to more conventional, more experienced uh, depth Players. options such as, say, a Gem Jenna McCormick or an Emma Checker? Yeah, look, it is, it is concerning. I think that to start off first with, with Jessica Nash, yes, um, she's had a starting debut and we've conceded within the first minute of the game. Uh, but other than that one moment, I think that she really stood up and showed a lot of maturity to, to finish out the half. Um, so I think that she's got a, a bright future ahead of her. Was she ready to play international football against the world number one? Uh, you know, potentially not at this stage. Is she going to be in the future? Definitely. She's, mm. she's got all the qualities. Um, but it is that big question of, is he looking to blood players that are too young? Um, looking at the, the World Cup and given it's you know, not that far away. Um, it's just that I think in Australia, we have a really big gap in players uh, sort of in their early 20s. Mm. And for me, that's because of we don't have a very good development program for players once they get out of the young Matilda's age, which is under 19. They don't play once, football. Yeah, exactly. It's it's only a half year of you know, semi-professional mm. football in the A-League and then it's back to you know, local NPL leagues. Um, and because you, you, we don't have an under-23s national team, if you haven't already made the Matildas by the time you're 19, it's almost like, oh, well, they're obviously not good enough. So I think holistically there's a there's a bigger issue, um, but whether these young players are going to be ready by the time the World Cup comes around, I don't know. It's it is frightening mm. uh, for me, yeah. um, but potentially he needs to look closer at you, you know, know those players who are in that early twenties playing in the A League. Let me take you back a few years. Um, I can remember heading off to Italy for the World Cup in 1990, which was a long, long time ago. And I remember the, the, all the talk beforehand about Italy, whether they'd be there or thereabouts. They had an experimental uh, side. Uh, they had some outstanding talent, but they, di they didn't know quite how to put it together. And lo and behold, come the, uh, the World Cup in 1990, they were the best team that didn't win the trophy. They, they only lost one game, and that was the game against Argentina, Diego Maradona's Argentina in Naples, and that was more politics than actual football. <laughs> um, so what I'm what I'm taking you to is sometimes you've got to be really bold and brave, mm. because they say fortune favours the brave. Is this Tony Gustafsson saying to all and sundry, listen, I'm going to throw them all in. We're going to we're going to find out whether we can temper them, uh, you know, in match play. I know it's I know it's dangerous, but what can you do? Uh, he's he's only just arrived uh, as the coach, and as he so eloquently said after the game in the match day comments, he says, "No, I'm not leaving. I'm staying on to do the sorts of things I haven't been able to do for, the, or I should have done for the last year." So he's got a lot of people mm -hmm. to meet, a lot of people to go and see, and of course we've got the A League women starts tomorrow. Yeah, so I'm sure he's going to go round and watch as many games as possible, um, and that's seriously exciting. Am I? Am I too optimistic and you're going to temper me and pull me back? Or do you think maybe you have something there, George? Maybe. No, I, I definitely think you've got something there and, and brave is a very easy way to explain what Tony has been doing over the last uh, 18 months in control. He's been very brave in the selections he's made and, and I think that we're kind of at the stage where we need to be brave uh, and potentially in the past, we haven't been brave enough and that's why we've got ourselves in this dilemma. So, Good girl. I mean, I think you look at Ellie Carpenter when she came in and, oh, yeah. and Alan Stajic was very brave when he took her to the Olympics sure. and now look at her. She's, oh. she's one of the best fullbacks in the world. So 
I think that, you know, you can be rewarded by being brave and uh, I definitely take my hat off to Tony Gustafson for being so brave. Well, Georgia, let's turn our attention to the A-League Women's that kicks off this weekend. Uh, your prediction for the chi- title you, winners... On, you're not allowed to say West, West, Western Sydney Wanderers well, either. In my opinion, I look at the squads and Melbourne Victory and Sydney <laughs> FC are the, are the two sides to beat again, last season's grand finalists. Yeah, look, I, I would have to agree with you. I'm putting Melbourne Victory and Sydney FC up there um, for title contenders. They've always got um, very good squads and they've managed to maintain a lot of their players from last year. Uh, another team that I think will, will come through this year is Canberra United. A few really good signings and the returning of Ash Sykes mm. um, after I think she's retired twice now. So it's great mm. to see uh, Ash Sykes back in the league. Um, but yeah, you, you can't go past Sydney FC and Melbourne Victory with um, Kyra Cooney Cross there. Uh, and now the signing of Courtney Nevin, who are both coming off the back of Olympic experience and how much that is, that will grow them as players. What about City? Look, it's, it's, it's an improved City side from last year, um, but they're not the, the strength that they used to be when they had... We almost called them the Matildas when they signed everyone uh, a few years ago and they were going back-to-back. I think that they're a stronger side than they were previously. Um, they've got Wilkinson, who is the starting striker for uh, New Zealand, and she's going to be a big presence for them up front. Um, and then, obviously, the return of Rebecca Stott. What yeah. a great story that is. Super story. Um, great player. Yeah. And she's a terrific uh, young woman who's just uh, done everything that she needed to do to, one, get herself healthy again, and then return to the field and make herself available, hopefully, to be part of that uh, New Zealand team when the Women's World Cup uh, has that opening game, of course, in New Zealand 2023. That that would be some story, wouldn't it, Georgia? Yeah, and well, what an inspiration she is to so many people as well. Of, you know, what you can achieve when you, when you set your mind to it and... Um, her being able to come back, I'm sure that if she's back to full fitness, she will be in that um, New Zealand national team for the the World Cup yeah. um, because she is such a good player when she's uh, at full fitness. What about your mob, the Wanderers? <laughs> uh, how do you see them doing this season? Oh well, they've they've improved already because they got rid of their deadwood, didn't they? Oh, um, stop <laughs> it. we were going to say to you, uh, any, any chance of you returning to the field? But clearly, Harps has got you weighed down, and you can't get free. <laughs> yeah, no, there will be no return for me this year. Uh, the the body's taken a bat, battering, and I haven't run in six months, so I think it'll take. Has me the body a repaired years, itself? Really. Have you repaired yourself from all those foot foot challenges? Yeah, not not fully, to be honest. Wow. Um, I'm still struggling a little bit with with both my ankles, um, which has always been an issue throughout my career. So I'm kind of uh, reassessing things and deciding whether I want to be able to walk at 50 or yeah. if I keep playing. So Take a I'm tip. enjoying Take all a the tip. commentary. Take a tip. Look after yourself. It, it means yeah. an awful lot. Um, by the way, just get um, Harps to sit down and it'll yeah. be a lot easier for you because I can't believe they've sat you right next to Harps when you do those uh, analyses uh, early in the game and late at half time. It's unfair. It's gross. I'd, I'd get you a step ladder and get you up there to push you down. Just say to him, Harps, please. George says, move. move. Just get them to turn on your mic up and Harps is down so you can get a word in occasionally. Uh, George, uh, it's fantastic to have you on the program. We better let you go. Uh, best of luck with all the coverage and uh, thank you for your insights. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me on. Thank you, Georgia. All the best. Georgia Yeoman Dale joining us on Sufin. Uh, we'll go to a break, Georgia, because we've got a pair of guests waiting on the other side. Troublemakers is what I hear. <laughs> Andy Pascalides and Eric Partaloo, a double bill coming up on the other side of this break. Are you looking to change your destiny in life? Be your own boss? Start your own business? If you are, you need people who understand your needs and are committed to helping you make it happen. At DKP and Co Chartered Accountants, we are more than just accountants. We are business advisors, taxation consultants, and strategists that specialised in setting up businesses. We understand the client, 
and give them the very best customised advice and strategies to achieve their goals. Visit our website, dkpco.com.au or give us a call today on 03 9023 9370. Fast, proactive, personal. That's DKP and Co Chartered Accountants. Since 1998, Lanco Group has been providing superior civil engineering solutions and advice to developers, local government and service authorities across Australia. Lanco Group is known for delivering sustainable, efficient solutions. By working closely with clients, Lanco Group is able to meet the complex infrastructure requirements for residential, commercial and industrial developments on time, on budget. Find out more at lancogroup.com.au. Lanco Group, your business partner for engineering solutions. With this great sporting nation who has yet to embrace fully the world's greatest game and for so long of trying to have the game accepted. And when I'm up to the big football field in the sky, I just want, want people just to remember I told you so. And suddenly the complexion of the game changes. Let's hope it doesn't, but this is the best period for Iran in the match. Ali Dhani, danger for Australia here. feel for them, You've, not just the boys, they are representative of so many people who make this game their life, it's just, uh, no, I can't say anything, right? All right. especially as they have the impetus, Aloisi, Cahill, Cahill! Football Nation Radio. You're listening to the State of Our Football Nation on FNR. Broadcasting out of our studios in Melbourne, uh, the torrential downpour has just about finished. Our, our special guests, though, are via Zoom in Goa. Um, I know the guy on the right side, Josh. Do you know who the guy is on the left? Yeah, we've chatted to him a couple of times here yeah, on the station. Have, He's got some interesting yeah. stories from his travails throughout uh, throughout Asia, especially. Yeah. He once yeah. played an away game in North Korea, would I, you believe? I, I remember the guy on the left because he, he scored a fabulous goal for City against victory in a derby. Mm, I choose not and to remember that, that one. It was a, it, it, he just <laughs> soared, put his head on the ball, and it went into the back of the net. And let me tell you, the stadium just erupted. Uh, Eric Partaloo and Andy Pascalides, a couple of young legends. Gentlemen, welcome to FNR. Good to be back on. Thanks for having us, guys. What are you, do what are you doing? Uh, are you commentating these days? Speak to me. Yeah. It certainly looks that way. Um, yeah, playing my playing career is on hold at the moment, shall we say, with a holding pattern. But, um, you know, I haven't decided what I'm going to be doing yet. I, I got let go um, out of my contract here with a team out, outside the window, which was unfortunate timing. So um, I was snapped up pretty quickly by the network and, you know, obviously done a little bit of TV work before and and he helped me out, you know, get me through this process, um, you know, to get across here. And Andy's been working here for what seven or eight seasons now. Yeah. So it was an easy decision in the end, just to, you know, fill the gap while I'm waiting to see what comes up in the next window. But you know, so far I'm really, really enjoying it. And yeah, I'm not sure if I'll go back to playing. But we'll have to wait and see. Is there is there a part of you that wants to play? You got unfinished business? Absolutely, yeah. I think when you know things, you know, certainly ended sour for me at Bengaluru FC. Um, you know, I'd love to finish on my own terms. I know I've got a lot to give physically, but you know, I'm 35 now. I have to start thinking about the next phase. You know, transitioning into something, and you know, I think this is kind of a Come natural on, progression. Eric, Eric, just give him a Eric, scoop. There. Eric, Eric, he's got a scoop, George. George, uh, go on. He's got give, a scoop. Go to scoop. It's a scoop. Go on. He's got. He's got this amazing offer from Estonia. <laughs> overnight, <laughs> overnight, seriously. Yeah, there's a few offers coming around from strange parts of the globe. But um, look, I'm really, really enjoying myself here, and I've actually, you know, gaining a lot out of it, you know, personally. So, 
Um, it's a good place to start over here in India, and let's see where it takes me. What's the the Premier League like? How's it been received? Are the crowd there are no crowds at the moment because of COVID, no. correct? No, look, the Super League's evolved from 2014. It's the eighth season, 11 teams this year. Uh, when it first started, there was only 14 games for the teams, and obviously now there's 20. They're looking at expanding. Uh, we're in a bubble in Goa. All the games are played at three stadiums. Even even the broadcast team, our, our group's about 60 to 70 personnel. We've taken over a whole hotel. No outside is allowed in our bubble, and we're split in half. So we're, we've got a game t tonight. We've got two Aussies in action tonight. Jordan Murray for Jamshid Paul against Joel Kianese for Hyderabad. Both teams doing very well this season. And um, tomorrow, John Helm, uh, the, the esteemed commentator, his crew will take over and do the next game. So it works well. Um, they've just aligned with One Football, which is a global reach of 100 million, a German company. So you can see the games on their platforms. Um, so it's available for everyone to see. It, it was on Fox every season. I'm, I'm really not sure Fox are doing it again. I, I assume that One Football has got the global rights now. Um, so, look, it's enjoyable to beat the stadium. We miss the fans, as you do. Can you imagine yeah. going to a Melbourne derby mm -hmm. with no fans? No. I mean, it's, no. that's tough. That's tough. But young bugger lugs over here, not because he's next to me. Um, he's made the transition from footballer to pundit very comfortably. Um, he commands a lot of respect because he's won titles here. Um, he, he was a big-name player. But for me, um, we've had a lot of Australians play over here, and we've got seven this year. But I think the, the, the top two Aussies that have played here, one's currently playing. He scored a cracking goal last night, David Williams, who you know well, George. Yep. And, of course, this guy here played about 67, 68 games, uh, a bucket load of goals and assists. And I know it's hard for him to tell you the true story of what happened to Bengaluru, but for legal reasons, we can't really elaborate. But... It's their loss and our gain as a broadcaster, a massive gain for us, for the global audience, um, because, you know, he's walked the walk and now he's talking the talk, so to speak. Fantastic stuff. Eric, uh, earlier this year you, you spoke out a little bit about not being allowed back into the country. Uh, just how hard has yeah. it been uh, living in the bubble? You've had this is it your, is situation with your, your club and your contract that, you know, we're not going to go into detail, but it's been a difficult time for you for sure. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, at that point in time, the Delta variant hadn't come through the world. And, you know, in hindsight, you know, it was a little bit premature of all of us to be, you know, crying about coming back home. And obviously the government must have been clued into about, you know, something big coming, and it was. Um, but at that point in time, like, I was, you know, thinking about coming home in the off-season and actually had that away trip in the Maldives and... Um, I still wasn't allowed to come back to Australia if I'd spent 14 days previous in India. And so the, all the IPL cricketers had to spend time outside of India to then come home and quarantine. And, you know, being in the, in the bubble for the last sort of two seasons, um, it takes its toll. You know, yeah. you know day in, day out, you, you, you're in the hotel, um, just going to training, coming back. And then not to mention what I had to go through to even get to, say, the UK to spend time with my family was you know, go via a third country, spend 10 days there, then go and spend another 10 days in quarantine. And then, mm. you know, going back to Australia um, in November there to get my visa for, for this was mm. the first time I'd been home in a couple of years. So, you know, you, you're definitely distant from family. Mm. Um, we've had it tough, but some of these crew members over here, mate, they've been IPL, World Cup, yeah. ISL, um, you know, bubbles for two years just, straight. Just continuous. bubble after bubble. Even get, I mean, getting here... Uh, Andy Penn is our, our presenter here. Uh, he went by, uh, was it uh, Malaysia? Malaysia, yeah. London. Did he stop off in Dubai? Yeah, I, I, went, I went Sydney, Dubai, Dubai, Delhi, Delhi, Goa. You, but you were lucky. You went yeah. Sydney, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, Bombay, yeah. Bombay, then back down. So the world's not the same anymore. No, you know, it's it just is a difficult it? place to move around. And neither are uh, all those uh, what they called uh, flying points that you used to get. Um, right. Once upon a time, they were worth their weight in gold. Not so much these days, are they, Andy? <laughs> oh, not really, but you know what? We, we get the fly business. So my <laughs> points are looking good. Oh, can I name the airline? Go I'm on. Not sure if, Go on. Uh, if anyone from Emirates is watching, thank you for making me a silver member. I've only flown with you four times. I'm loving it. <laughs>
But yeah, but you don't go just uh, you know Sydney to Melbourne, mate. You go the full the full hog. Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was telling Eric about one of the things that we were really uh, discussing away from football, which is pretty cool about family and and how I've only been to Greece three times. He's been to Estonia just the one, one time. time, and he was thinking of perhaps going back and 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 like Krishna, you know, Fiji and Indian has come back to his cultural home, Calcutta. And he's playing for ATK Mohan Bagan, setting all sorts of records. His daughter was born here a couple of weeks back. And it's it's interesting, we've had the same conversation that our family, our history, you know, and and, and one of the things I loved about old football was the history of those multicultural communities and what they brought to the table to our game. Mm. And unfortunately, in 17 years, the A-League really hasn't addressed it. Mm. And I know I got in trouble a few years ago for saying that, but I'll, I'll stick by that, that um, the one thing that I always loved about our game and being a, a Aussie born is our rich history like yourself, George. I mean, we've got a history that leads to a genocide that the government now uh, is, it's wonderful. I think while I was here, George, is it yep. correct? The yep. federal government are now going to recognise this. Correct. So, all three, yeah, what, all this, three this genocides what, that happened. Perfect. Uh, look like they're now going to be recognised, which is quite extraordinary. It's That's yeah. not a big deal. That's an extraordinary deal because you and I have spoken about this many times over and we never thought it would happen in our lifetime. And, but it looks that's, very that's, exciting. And it does. And, and look, and this is what football does. It brings all cultures and peoples together. And um, sadly, from the old NSL days, we've lost a group of supporters that were made distant overnight. Mm. Um, we didn't embrace them and yep. say, look, this is the way forward. This is what we need to do. We all, we, the, the NSL was a basket case. Mm. You didn't play old NSL. I played, I played one, 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 game, one, one game for, for Northern Spirit, but even that, it was difficult for, you know, ethnicity groups to, to attach themselves to the new A-League because it was just one team per city. And when you support a club your whole, your whole life and your family goes through there, you go to the club on the weekend, you're doing this and that. Um, you know, there's a huge community aspect, and I think they've kind of fallen away from having that community aspect in the A-League, for sure. Uh, very true. Uh, the Optus uh, team here in Australia has made a point of uh, creating a series of vignettes with uh, that view where football belongs. Oh, that's right. And we've had yeah. the likes yeah. of Aloisi, we've had the likes of uh, George Columbaris, uh, 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 Nick Giannopoulos and others, uh, help to tell some of those, uh, you know, reminiscences that, that took them back to their early days, whether it was Pratt and Park helping your grandfather or your uncle, you know, distribute the, the best nuts in town uh, and yeah. then watching the game. Um, they were special times, um, Andy. They and, were. And, and what, when yeah. we reflect on them, and when we reflect on them, they're rich with, with great characters. And I'm just wondering now, as we, as we reminisce and talk about the, the differences, imagine all the players that you've, you've had a chance to compete with or against and play with. Uh, that would be some sort of in inventory list, uh, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of only, only just saw you know, the last little piece of the NSL before it broke up into the A-League. And even in that, situation for myself a whole generation of footballers you know we're not given an opportunity to become professional so at 17 i had to you know basically go across to the uk and trial you know every off season i was having i think i was part-time with northern tigers and Parramatta and Melita and the, the the state leagues were you know through the roof with talent for a couple of years and then every team then had one team per city and you had 20 squad members so for an 18 year old kid you're never going to get a chance but the pathway is a little bit more clearer now for the for the young guys coming through but certainly for myself i had to go outside the country to forge a career to come mm. back mm. and not many people you know took that that gamble or had the means to do so um very very thankful for the the family and upbringing i had but mm. you know a lot of good footballers still go to waste um in australia whether they can't afford the fees or they can't align themselves with a club um you know we all, do all, all the mental strength yeah to leave family yeah and, and support yourself, and then you're in that group of youngsters at a professional club where there's another 30 similar type players of ability that you're yeah. fighting for their spot, and you're the foreigner, and, and you would have gone through that. The, the, just uh, just the, my last comment on the old new football, the one thing that I've loved is the advent of the FFA Cup because it's given 
old football the chance to embrace. And mm. one of the, 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 the compelling moments for me was last week, Peter Philopoulos, who we all love, and it's great that he's at the coalface. Uh, he's done so much, as we know, in Victoria and with Perth Glory. He sent me a photo with James Johnson, Peter Escopoulos, Jim Patikas and Peter Catholis from Belmore Sports Ground last week at the FFA Cup where there were thousands there to watch Sydney Olympic play Sydney FC. Yeah, that's great. Did, he tell, that's you, did what... he tell you how bad the weather was? <laughs> no, I mean, quite no. seriously. They had an appalling night and a week earlier, South Melbourne had played uh, Melbourne City again at Lakeside. And the That's weather right. was just as bad. And the fans <laughs> made their effort to get there. It Had it been a, a, a fine weather night on both occasions, yeah. they would have been truly memorable. They were memorable for those that love the game mm. and especially yeah. hear that chant, Olympic, <laughs> Olympic. Yeah, it just, it, it, the, the hair on the back of your neck, especially Andy would remember uh, in the days when John Constantine was president and uh, when we had... Uh, Venables and others there looking after and leading those young teams filled with guys like Chris Kalanzas. Um, uh, yeah. you know, and the, the, the stories... Uh, Eric, I'm just wondering if Andy has ever told you the Chris Kalanzas story about how he was swooped up by one Greek club on his way to another <laughs> Greek club at the airport in Greece, Elinikon, not Sparta. Yeah, yeah. It's a story and a half Andy needs to tell you because... It's, oh. if, you, if, if he tells you, if we tell you here now, you'll go, no, nah, it didn't happen. Yeah. But no, it did. Look, it did. It, it, isn't it ironic you would make mention of that? Because a lot of people <laughs> talk <were> about... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, the irony is it happened to Mark Baturka. The president of Croatia was what? on the tarmac. Serious? Mark Baturka. Yeah, Mark Baturka was basically told, listen, you're coming to Europe and you're going to play for Dinamo Zagreb. Yeah. That's what every good young person of Croatian background has to do. And as we know, he transfers to Zagreb, Melbourne, Croatia, get a nice transfer fee that ends up building a brand new stadium, which is named after Mark Paduka. And then from Zagreb, Celtic and, and an incredible journey through Europe. But do, do you remember I mean, who took him from, from Dinamo Zagreb to, to Celtic? No. Who did? Josef Englosh. It was Vanglosh. Vanglosh. Wow. That's, why, that's what makes the journey Celtic. even more exciting mm. because he had come to Australia, Eric, can you believe this, yeah. from Czechoslovakia as it was then. He came to our school, our high school in Sydney, to learn English, to further his English and to spread yeah. the gospel because he was a preacher of the game, you follow, and yeah. a great coach. And lo and yeah. behold, he sees this young Australian talent and he goes... If I ever get an opportunity, I'm going to mine this talent. And sure enough, yeah. when he became the coach of New South Wales, when he was the coach at Prague, he saw some of this outstanding young yeah. talent. And he had no fear when he was at Celtic to say to all and sundry, there's a smart young bomber from Victoria called Viduka. And the rest is history. Wow. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Well, George, I'm, I'm anxious that we might be uh, losing the younger generation on this one. So uh, <laughs> let, let's, re let's go back to the present day. Uh, Eric, tell me about the, the quality of play in the ISL uh, these days. You know, I, I don't think its reputation was done any good by the, the Santo Sam and Ed jokes about superannuation <laughs> league back in the day, which while a good yeah, pun, yeah. maybe not so accurate yeah. these days. I mean, we see uh, players, Australian players making the gamble to go over there. Speaking of making a gamble to go overseas, I mean, someone like Jordan Murray, yeah. whose goal scoring statistics in the NPL were off the charts. Mm. And when he finally gets an A-League yeah. club on his CV, he suddenly got professional opportunities overseas. I guess COVID hasn't helped, but, um, you know, there, yeah. there was a time where the ISL was, was poaching some of the A-League's best players there for a little bit. Yeah, look, the first three seasons, absolutely, is you, you've hit the nail on the head. They were playing with, what, six foreigners and you could sign up to any any number. Um, so the Indian, you know, level wasn't improving because we had all these foreigners coming. Who through. didn't come? Yeah. Adel Piero, Roberto Carlos, yeah. Nicholas Anelka, yeah. uh, just uh, John Arna Reese. It just went on and on and on. They had too many players that were coming at the end of their careers, even coming out of retirement. But then after season three, they started to get their act together. They put two new clubs in, you know, Bengaluru FC and Jamshapur come into the league. Um, you know, and the foreign rule now has reduced. So now it's only four on the pitch and six in the squad. So this season is a little bit of a transition period where we're actually seeing a lot more Indian talent coming through, scoring a lot of goals yeah. as well. 
Um, you know, I, I definitely think the standard's going up and up every year, and certainly the level of foreigners that are coming to the league are guys in their mid-20s, early 30s, not seeing these guys at the end of their careers. And when I first came here, I was, what, 30, 31 years old. So I was worried that I was, you know, what's going to happen if I play here and then am I going to make a move afterwards? But I, I end up playing my whole, you know, you know, mid part of my 30s here. But for someone like Jordan Murray coming at a young age, um, you know, he's finding it tough to get game time now because the foreign guys have gotten the side at a, a top well, level. They've got Greg Stewart, who won a, a, a premiership with Rangers under Gerard last season. Yeah. And Naria Spauskas, who's a Golden Lithuanian boot Golden Boot winner, um, top scorer. The one thing that I've never asked Eric is how many Indian players do you think, honestly, could cut the mustard in the A-League back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always thought about this because, you know, we used to have the plus one spot, didn't we, back home? And right. It makes a lot of sense commercially and also, you know, to, to, to make that Australia-India link even stronger, which is going to happen, you know, more, more so than the Australian-China link, I think, in the future. But, yeah, I, I'd love to see some players come across here. You know, certainly a goalkeeper, in, you know, Guprit Singh Sandhu, who's the number one goalkeeper in India. He's a six-foot-seven bloke, um, amazing goalkeeper. So Neil Chetri, who's also the captain of the Indian national team, is a bit older now, could make the jump. Um, but we're going to see these, you know, the, the, the City Football Group's obviously bought a club uh, in Mumbai City and they're developing talent, I hope, to get some of these boys across the pond because there's a talent pool here that nobody has really respected for a long time. Um, and we just hope now that one or two of these players can go across to a country like Thailand, maybe Australia, and it opens up that link. But look, the level's, you know, going up and up every year. Well, speaking of embracing Australia's multicultural communities, I mean, what would having an Indian player in the A-League do for the A-League in terms of crowds? I, I remember talking to, yeah. to Matt Windley back in yep. uh, when there were the expansion 11. process and, and he was looking to get Team 11 in the competition. His mm -hmm. dream was to bring Sunil Treachery over as the marquee player. Mate, it, it makes sense in a team like Western Sydney. You know how big the Indian community is out there. Huge. Um, you know, hard-working people, just lovely people to be around. Um, and as footballers, you know, like I said, they're, they're, they're a type of, um, you know, a teammate that are open-minded. They want to learn. They want to get better. Um, they're motivated. And, you know, before they weren't really, you know, that athletic. They were quite, how would I say you know, trying to be professional without the right direction. But in the last couple of years, the Indian Super League have had good coaches come across. Yeah. You know, the city groups bought into it. So there's a whole level of professionalism that's coming through. And some of these boys that are playing in the ISL now are, are very, very good players and could easily play at a different level. But Yeah, I, you know, look, you know, the coaching is great. Des Buckingham checkmated mm -hmm. a guy who's won more titles than anyone against Christian Williams, 5-1 last night. Yeah. They did have a player sent off, but it was 3-0 at that stage. The one thing that I would say to anyone from the A-League clubs, honestly, what I can't understand, that there hasn't been a relationship, a strong relationship fostered. We've seen City Football Group buy into Mumbai, smart business. They win the title. Melbourne City win the title. Man City win the title. Good for business. Yeah. What I would say if I was an A-League club in terms of development, contact Andy or Eric and, and say, listen, are there three or four young Indian players that we can bring into our academy yeah. and spend six months with them and see where their levels can take them? Because I believe, with all due respect to the structures here, mm. I think if we could do that back home, mm. and you start this cultural yeah. engagement through football, mm. Um, we're, we've got this amazing bond through cricket, yeah. as we've seen over the years. And the unique part of the equation here in India with football and cricket is Virat Kohli is a part owner of FC Goa. Ganguly's been involved with ATK, Mohan Bagan. Um, we've had MS Dhoni at Chennai Inn. Yeah. So all these cricketers, top end, Tendulkar, Kerala yeah, Blasters. The Blasters. So yeah. they love their football, but we haven't, as a country or as a football nation, say, through the FFA or the state bodies, mm. come up with some sort of interaction on an ongoing basis. And it would be beneficial for both because if you develop a couple of Indian players, they could become raw jewels and all of a sudden they could be playing A-League football. Yeah. Oh, it's massive. Look at the, the size of the population too. And I think you can see it with countries like India and China. China's, a, you know, spent millions and millions of dollars of trying to produce is mass-produced players in, in big academies and, you know, far corners of China. But 
not having that exposure level, as you know, in a football developing country, um, you know, you, you need to have those players being exposed. And that's why the players here probably stunted their growth a little bit. The, the structure and the pathway is not clear. Um, and once they get to, you know, senior level, are they going to go further than the Indian Super League? At the moment, they're not. So you've, you've left us with plenty to think about, uh, guys. Well yeah. done. Well done. Uh, so who, what happens now? Who are you calling tonight, guys? Well, it's raining. It's That's raining. I'm trying to get that. It's 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 actually bucketing down. We've had um, it's unfamiliar to me, to be honest with you. Coming coming here the last uh, seven or eight years, that we've got this weather that we've got at the moment. But um, I'm hearing it's also similar back home. But yeah, it's horrendous. Yeah, we've got a we've got a big game tonight. We've got Jamshed for Hyderabad, um, and Jordan Murray. Uh, we we await to see whether he gets a start. He's come off the bench twice. Joel Key and Easy. Uh, when he came off the bench last time out, he scored with his first touch. And Joel Pianese, who's, who's done very well at Hyderabad, this is his second season with the club. And, and obviously, Jordan was top scorer for Kerala Blasters. And you think of, of that club and you think of some of the players that have played at that club and um, some of the coaches that they've had at that club. You know, Steve Koppel, mm. uh, Bruce James. You know, we've had some amazing look people of football, yeah. pedigree come here as players and coaches. But... It's a transition now. It's all about the Indian players. We've yeah. had, I think, now after last night, we had three more Indians play for the very first time in the Hero Indian Super League. So we've had 16 new young Indian players being given a chance to make their debut. So um, it's it's a wonderful opportunity. Eric, yeah. Eric, yeah, and the, Eric, give us an, uh, give us a sense of the style of football the Indians are producing. Uh, we're not seeing six foot seven centre backs, are we? Are we seeing dainty, dainty, uh, you know, attacking midfielders yeah. and 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 eights and tens? When, yeah. when I came to the country, even just you know looking at their their faces, everyone is so different in India. You know, from from the south of India to the northeast of India, completely different complexion, completely yeah. different body shape. Um, generally speaking, mindset, mindset. That yeah. the northeast players are very, very fast, athletic. Mostly, you got your wingers that are from the northeast. Um, your big, tall defenders are from the south of India. Your midfielders are from Goa because they're fitter. <laughs> There's definitely that diversity where you couldn't put your finger on it. But I definitely say, um, you know, since I've been here since season four to season eight, um, you can definitely see, you know, the first season maybe six or seven teams were were pushing for that top four, and now in this you know stage of the season, season eight. Um, anyone can win it. Any team could be capable of winning the league. So it's, it's, it's just made that competition even closer. Yeah, definitely. It's an open. It's an open competition this season, no doubt. And I think the fact that only four foreigners are allowed on the pitch, and what coaches tend to do here is they look more for a centre back combination of two foreigners, mm -hmm. one midfielder, and one at the top. But now they're juggling around and going, hey, you know what? Let's work on an Indian centre back with a foreign yeah. centre back, and gives us better attacking options. So they're still trying to iron all that out at the moment. They're trying to produce, and that's a good thing that we're saying on commentary all the time, it gives somebody an opportunity to stand out in those spine positions because generally speaking, as like Andy said, you put your foreigners through the spine. Now we're seeing the emergence of someone like a Narendra Gullah who's playing for, for Jamshedpur alongside of Peter Hartley, who's a foreigner from the UK. And he's doing a great job, but he's being led, you know, by the foreign player to try and, you know, develop his talent. And then up front... We still haven't seen enough strikers come through because, generally speaking, every Asian league, number nine is from the Brazil or from Europe. And um, we're hoping to see the emergence of some of these players through the spine. Are you There's watching the Australian Indian leagues? Any, any A-league yet? Just highlights. Yeah, it's just highlights. Just what highlights. we can get. Not much at all. Um, what are we, a couple of rounds in? Yep. Brisbane Raw yep. looks like they've lost a couple of games, so that's not good for me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I still follow it. Like obviously, I still follow Brisbane Roar and Melbourne City. See how they're getting on, and um, but yeah, it's you difficult mean you to don't the phone do. and speak to PK. That's right. Well, I interviewed Des Buckingham last night, so I was trying to give him a little plug. But um, I don't think PK needs any um, any more <laughs> any more admirers. He's doing really well at Melbourne, isn't he? So yeah, he is. good on him. You actually, you gave PK a plug last night. Yeah, that's what I said in, in the uh, post match interview. Yeah. Right? I picked that up straight. That was your first question. I was trying to get a move. <laughs> but, you know, I'll tell you one thing I've been following, and I've been doing it for a long time since he made the move. Uh, I've been following Ange Postacoglu, what he's doing at Celtic. I reckon mm. it's awesome. Um, I, I hope he continues on that path because 
I think it's important for any Australian, particularly players or coaches, Correct. to go overseas and be successful because it opens doors for the ones behind. Yeah. And that's the most important thing that they're doing outside of delivering on the field as a player or as a coach. He, great he's validation. Big on that. Great validation. Yeah, he's, that's right. He's big on that too. He's a great coach in his own right. He's worked hard. Oh, you, hard. Yeah, 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 twice. But he's, he's the type of guy that, yeah, he... he just creating that pathway, path and everything is into it. Hutchison, for example, going to Yokohama, places like that. Um, he's always trying to help young Aussie coaches because he knows how how hard it was for himself. So I think his role is much much bigger than just his playing career. You know. Well, I think the Wi-Fi is just starting to desert us now, so we oh, better let back. you guys go, uh, Andy, Eric. Yeah. Always a pleasure. That's and Eric, uh, best of luck with your next move wherever that is. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Andy, Eric, we'll and thank again. you, Andy. Yasu. We'll yes, take a break. Absolutely. On the other side, we've got Glenn Rolls from La Liga talking about the title race, an event, a live screening stage right here in Melbourne on the weekend. We are more than engineers. We are more than project managers. We are more than surveyors. We are more than infrastructure specialists. We are more than planners. So, who are we? We are problem solvers, providing the highest quality service and results. We are a team of skilled professionals, focused on customer needs and outcomes. We are 23 years of industry experience, adhering to the highest safety standards. We are Melbourne, and we are right across Victoria. We are the Lanco Group, your business partner for engineering solutions. Lanco Group. We are more than you realise, and we are ready to partner with you. Are you looking to change your destiny in life? Be your own boss? Start your own business? If you are, you need people who understand your needs and are committed to helping you make it happen. At DKP and Co Chartered Accountants, we are more than just accountants. We are business advisors, taxation consultants, and strategists that specialised in setting up businesses. We understand the client and give them the very best customised advice and strategies to achieve their goals. Visit our website, dkpco.com.au, or give us a call today on 03 9023 9370. Fast, proactive, personal. That's DKP and Co Chartered Accountants. listening to the state of our football nation on FNR. In Melbourne where we broadcast from. Um, we're not in the green room. We're in the very much, what would you call it? It's almost like you're in a sauna. <laughs> but, uh, things marginally improving by the hour. Uh, Josh Parrish uh, looking after the controls. George Danikian here. It's State of Our Football Nation. We've had the opportunity to talk to uh, Georgia Yeoman Dale, who is the uh, one of the, the commentary team at Network 10 or Paramount Plus, who's doing a tremendous job with uh, a brand new broadcaster taking the reins uh, for the game in Australia. Then we caught up with a couple of guys uh, in Goa. In India, we're talking about uh, Eric uh, Partaloo and, of course, Andy Pascalides. And now we've decided, you know, switch things around. We're going to talk about La Liga, but more importantly about a special event that's happening in Melbourne that uh, brings in La Liga. And where do you normally go to talk La Liga? You go to Glenn Rolls. Glenn, welcome. Hi, guys. How are you both? Uh, we're OK, uh, but I, I hear that you're contemplating coming down under to Melbourne, and if that's the case, bring a huge umbrella or a, or a brand-new set of galoshes. Got no idea what galoshes are, but, yeah, I'll be, I'll be bringing those down, no doubt. I have to look that up, George. But, um, but yeah, it's been crazy weather, hasn't it? And, and yeah, heading down to Melbourne this weekend, and, and really much looking forward to it. Love getting down there every time I, I get the chance to, so... The weather gets really unsettled every time Josh goes to Canberra. It's as if he sets off some set of um, <laughs> or different, you know, uh, warning bells because the minute he comes back, we get an array of torrential storms. And I keep saying to him, mate, 
Less is more, please. Well, I'm looking at the forecast for Sunday morning, oh, Glenn, and zero uh, percent chance of rain. Oh, we'll see about that. But uh, <laughs> tell us what's happening. What's happening? So yeah, making the most of I, I guess the the league, La Liga, and, and and how the standings are at the moment. Real Sociedad are right up at the top. They're having a, a you know a stellar year. Um, on the back of that, having the Australian soccer as captain, right, um, involved in that team, Matty Ryan. Um, they're playing Real Madrid this weekend. So we thought it would be a, an amazing opportunity for us to put on a small event. Um, you know, uh, it's limited limited capacity. I think we're going to get try, try and get 50 to 60 people down there. Obviously, with COVID restrictions, we can't really go more. Um, but, yeah, just really sort of give back to our fans and, and try to, uh, you know, I, I know it's been a tough time down there in Melbourne, especially um, with all the lockdowns and whatnot. So, so yeah, reconnecting with our fans, um, and of course, promoting Real Sociedad as well, um, and all these things that I mentioned before. And of course, you know, Real Madrid are playing. So anytime Real Madrid play, it's going to attract a lot of fans and a lot of uh, a lot of interest from from football people everywhere. A huge transition period for La Liga, isn't it? Some of the the two great giants, yeah. Barca mm. and Real, going through in in their own way and in their own fashion uh, an overhaul. Uh, what have you made of it? Yeah, I guess um, an overhaul, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle of sport, really, sure, you know. Sure, sure. Of course, people can't, can't go on until they're playing, they can't play until they're 40, 50 years old, right? So some so are trying, really, some are course, trying. Crying, and if they can get away with it, then of course all power to them. But I think, you know, an overhaul, you mentioned an overhaul, couple of that was with COVID, with the current situation. And I think it's been really testing, not only for clubs in Spain, but but all across Europe and all across the world. So um, that being said, you know, clubs have had to to look at other measures they could do to to bring in bring in players and and whatnot and do their business. And I think, um, you know, Real Madrid and Barcelona are still doing very very well. You just have to look at this, the Barcelona squad. They're bringing up some of the best talents of footballers in the world right now. Of course, Real Madrid are starting to hit a bit of form as well. Um, so, so yeah, while, while you say overhaul, I say exciting times ahead, not only for those two clubs, but the likes of Real Sociedad now, Atletico Madrid, of course, winning La Liga last year, um, Se Sevilla, Seville, uh, Villarreal, you know, the, the current um, UEFA, Cup, UEFA Europa, Europa League. Is that what it's called? No, it's yeah, not. Yeah. I can't remember what it's called, yeah. So they beat Manchester United last year. So you've got a, a number of clubs now in La Liga that are very, very competitive. And I think this weekend should showcase that really with Real Sociedad um, against Real Madrid. 100%. Well, Madrid squad uh, looking very strong still, of course. That midfield triumvirate of Casemiro, Cruz and Modric continues to do the business. Benzema has really stepped up. Uh, since Ronaldo's departure to Juventus a few years ago. Uh, but the new star on the scene for me uh, is the kid who's now calling himself Vinny Junior. Oh, it's not yeah, Vinicius, Vinicius anymore. Oh, yeah. But he scored a goal against Sevilla uh, last round that absolutely blew my socks off. Just chesting the ball down on the wing, beating two players and burying it in the top corner. Just how special is this kid? Yeah, right. Like he's, he's hitting a rich vein of form. And I think, you know, with the, with the flash name change as well. Um, which kind of appeals to a broader audience, no doubt. But, yeah, I think he's one of a lot of special players, not only in Real Madrid, but across the, the whole of the league. And I think it's really exciting not knowing what's, what to expect and, and what to, what's going to be coming from these youngsters. Um, I certainly love watching, you know, Pedri um, in, in the midfield for Barca, you know, alongside other youngsters as well. So, yeah, but Vinicius Jr., what a player, right? And, and that goal especially was 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 very very special i see you mentioned pedri he got uh, acknowledged in the recent ballon d'or uh, uh there are, there is a fantastic crop of extraordinary talent that's just on the horizon they're just showing us um some of the things that about 15 years ago uh the the football world at the time was was starting to hear a name called messi and there was a young guy called Ronaldo who was making waves at Manchester United. Now that whole era, uh, they're still playing, but and they're still playing at a great level, but they're playing differently. And suddenly, as you touched on, there are a couple of names that may create a whole new era. Uh, and La Liga, I think, needs it. When I said overhaul, I didn't mean that in a disparaging way. I meant it in a natural... Na it's natural. It's perfectly natural. 
It, we live in this world of recycling, uh, you know, and if we want to make this world better, we need to be better <laughs> recyclers, you know, um, yeah. and not waste so much. So for me, it is a natural period. Um, the, the, the great giants of the past have had to move on or, or are about to move on. I notice that there's a great name. One of the great uh, players of Barca has gone back and he's been anointed as their new manager. That's a huge responsibility. But he doesn't look like he's shirking any, any of that responsibility in any way, shape or form. He's saying, bring it on. Yeah, I, exactly right. I think it's really exciting that we've got Chubby back in, in La Liga currently. Um, he kind of did, I guess you could say, his apprenticeship overseas and, and obviously you guys can comment on on the level of that and how we went over there but I think it's yeah fantastic for us as a league and as a competition having him back such a great personality and he was you know such a mm -hmm. a great player obviously formed a, a formidable midfield there with Iniesta right and of course Iniesta is his partner in crime is still is still kicking the football mm -hmm. around in, in Japan but but yeah obviously Chubby's gone down the coaching route and you said you know we're on sort of the cusp of of uh, you know all these talented youngsters coming through i think la liga for for well, as long as i can remember is, has always been a league to have youngsters coming through because such an emphasis is put on um, talent development and also coaching coaching formation and development as well so the best coaches are out of spain and and obviously the the most talented youngsters are always coming out of spain or, or there or thereabouts right so i think um yeah people shouldn't worry there's there's a lot of Talented youngsters, both domestically and, of course, you know, all these big clubs as well are still getting the, the most talented players in as well. Um, so, again, you know, we're really looking forward to not only this weekend, but the rest of the season. You've got, I, I think, I certainly think, you know, Real Madrid are probably four points, five points ahead at the moment. Um, Atletico Madrid as well as Seville have got a game in hand, um, so they can still catch up. But it's really about, you know, the season's so long. Um, Real Madrid are hitting form now, but they kind of, they were... You know, started they started a bit slowly. Real Sociedad came out of the blocks really, really quickly. So if they can get some of that form back, you know, no doubt they'll they'll come close. But it's also about how how can these teams, um, I guess, manage all the competitions that they're playing, not only with the league, but but of course with the cup, um, the Copa del Rey, as well as these European Championships as well. So yeah, it, it's going to be a really, really fascinating title race, definitely. Well, it's more competitive than maybe it's ever been. And uh, Real Sociedad, La Real, are, are part of that. Mm. Uh, talk to us about this team from, from San Sebastian, which is a bit of a beachside paradise, but they've got a very strong <laughs> yeah. regional identity there. Well, I was going to say that, and I actually listened to, to Eric talk, talk a bit before about, you know, Indian football and, and the diversity that's, that's in India. I think people kind of overlook the you know the diversity that's in spain and that exists there people talk about tiki taka and barcelona and, and whatnot but if you ask john aloisi what the football was like up in the north of spain when he was playing and especially back then when the pitches weren't very good correct he would say that it's some of the hardest hard-nosed football you, you know you can come across so um spain is very regional it's very cultural um obviously there's different languages that speak are spoken in, in different regions of spain um, so I think that brings with it uh, certain styles of football as well in these different regions. And as you mentioned, like Real Sociedad are from the north of Spain, from the, from the Basque country, mm. um, a region which is quite renowned for its tough, tough both physically and, and mentally people. You know, they're very, very tough people and they just love their football and they love getting behind their team. And of course, San Sebastian, I'm going to sort of touch on why people should, should I'm going to plug Real Sociedad. I know I have to be neutral and support all the teams, <laughs> but, but Real Sociedad is actually located in my most, I guess, my, my favourite place in the whole world, San Sebastian, Donosti, in Spain. It's a, it, it is a paradise. The weather's not always very good in Basque, in the Basque region, but in summer it's pretty good. And the beaches are beautiful, surf's amazing, the food is outstanding, and I think the people are just really, really you know, lovely people as well as passionate. So it's a great um, club to get behind, no doubt. And of course, having Matty Ryan there, I mean, people have to get behind their own, right? So, you know, the Aussies have got to get behind Matty Ryan. He's the captain of, of the Socceroos. And, you know, obviously there's two two very good goalkeepers at the moment sort of jousting for that role. Um, just, uh, you know, Alex Romero at the moment, he's, I think, the number one goalkeeper in terms of clean sheets. So he's, he's in probably career best form also. So I think there's so many reasons for people to support Real Sociedad and, and we're hoping to get people down to this event on Sunday morning down at Argyle Reserve. It's a free event. We're going to be putting on breakfast for everyone. 
and Do they have to register? Do they have to they have register, to register because of COVID? Yeah, of course, they have to register. It's COVID safe. It's a COVID safe venue. Go onto Eventbrite and look up La Liga's um, race to the title and they can register on that. And in doing so, they enter uh, two halftime draws for either Real Madrid shirt or a Real Sociedad shirt. And the first 14 fans for Real Sociedad that go, we're going to give them either a Real, so a Real Sociedad jumper or official match jersey, scarf or hat. So, yeah, all for free. So please, please, people of Melbourne, football fans, I've looked at the other games at the same time. Not a lot going on as well. <laughs> so come on, all you EPL snobs, get out there and support some Spanish Spanish football, La Liga, Matty Ryan. Glenn, you can't Roll, Glenn Rolls is our guest on F FNR's State of Our Football Nation. And we're talking about a, a special event happening in Melbourne on Sunday. And make sure you register. Um, it sounds seriously exciting. And uh, as uh, you may have worked it out, uh, Sociedad is the, uh, the, the flavour of the month for, for Glenn. And the reason for that is because there's an Australian uh, number one, the custodian, Matty Ryan, the current soccer root keeper. Um, you know, the other thing about La Liga that we, we, keep, we, keep, we discount, we don't give enough credit to, they, they ne have never feared putting a 15 or a 16-year-old on the pitch. They've always believed if they're good enough, especially coming through our systems and our academies, then we give them the opportunity to shine. And I reckon that's why we've seen so many truly outstanding talents just blossom. You know, and, and Vinicius is one of those who, you know, they give him, an, and uh, is it Javi, the, the young 15, 16 yep. year old, uh, an extraordinary talent. And they, get, they don't give him just a half job, they've got some serious jobs to do. They put him in, in places on the pitch where, uh, you know, if they let you down, you lose. So Sp Spain has that maturity about it uh, where they, if they believe in a talent, they back it. Definitely. I think it goes back to the clubs, in my opinion, and the, the solid foundations that they have, right? Um, it's not like they're going to field, a, you know, 11 players that are under the age of, of 2019. Obviously, these youngsters are going in and they've got, you know, they look over to their right, they've got Benzema. They look over to their left, they've got Modric. And the same in Barca and the same in basically anywhere you go in, in La Liga, whether it be Villarreal, Valencia, Mallorca, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I think the mixture is really, really exciting this year, as I said before. You've got, you know, these older statesmen that have been there um, and done that, but that are still, you know, and, and some of them are in career best form. Um, you know, take the example of Benzema. And then you've got, um, you know, these youngsters coming through to, to match that as well you know, who are showcasing their talent. So I think it's really, really uh, exciting for us. And again, it's just who knows who's going to win this year. Obviously, probably Real Madrid are the bookies' favourites, but Let's I mean, see. I, 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 yeah, it's also a coin for me. It's going to be really, really, it's going to come down to the wire, George. I really believe that. So I'm just looking at this uh, Real Sociedad lineup, and who are the players to be excited about? I mean, uh, I think Oya Thabal has proved that you don't need to play for one of the big two or big three to be picked for your national team. And certainly Luis Enrique has cast a net a bit wider and he's, he's a great player to watch, very intelligent. Uh, but there's currently a bit of a battle for places up front in that team because not only have they got Alexander Isaac at their disposal, who who wowed a few fans when he's, with his work at the Euros for Sweden, but uh, uh, the... Uh, partner in crime for uh, Norway alongside Erling Haaland is Alexander Sorloth, and he's on loan from RB Leipzig. And uh, who, who do you think is going to start on the weekend up front is my question. Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, Isak's been starting, hasn't he? And they sort of use Sorloth just to come on and bully a few bully a few individuals. He's what a big he unit. Come? He is a big oh, unit, yeah, yeah. One meter, he looks like a, a ruckman for... for <laughs> For Collingwood or, or Carlton or one Go of these easy. teams. Go easy. Yeah, yeah man, to be honest, not going to answer the I don't, don't know too much about the AFL. But, but yeah, he's a big, big body. Um, I expect that they'll probably play Alexander Isaac um, to begin with and then and then bring on Solath to a, as I said, soften, soften a few, few of the opposition. Um, yeah, because he, I, I watched him the other day. He comes on and he just occupies the ball so well. Like he just gets his body in front of, mm. you know, defenders really, really well. So... Probably expect that, as you said, they've got Oyar Sabal, um, David Silva running, you know, pulling the strings in the midfield with yes. with Mikel Marino, who who their coach Emmanuel um, Iwas Iwasil said that is one of the best midfielders going around at the moment. That's his opinion. Um, as well as, of course, we've got the race for uh, you know for the um, for the goalkeeper role. So 
they have uh, quite a bit of depth at the moment this year, Real Sociedad, and I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if they, well, if this match goes, I don't know, if it's like 2-1 either way or a draw. I mean, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a blowout. Definitely not. It's going to be a really close one. And even this morning's match, Real, Real Madrid played this morning against Athletic Club Bilbao. And, I mean, they could have lost by four goals, Real Madrid. Athletic Club Bilbao had had all these opportunities and obviously they didn't convert one of them, but but that was 1-0 in a really tight match and that was at the Bernabeu. So so this is at the uh, Reali um, Stadium in San Sebastian, Real Sociedad's home ground. So again, expect a really, really tight one. It's the uh, cliche tough place to go, oh, the north yeah. of Spain, where they breed them tough. Uh, very, very tough. Glenn, we'll leave it there. Uh, if you want to go down to uh, what to time Argyle do you Reserve? want them there? What would you? What time uh, would you like them there? Kickoffs at seven. I mean, we'll have the the bacon and egg rolls and and um, you know the tuppers, Australian tuppers, bacon and egg rolls, as well as the coffee flowing from from quarters to seven, ten to seven. So you know, if they want to come down. You know, get the dads to, to give the mums a rest and, and take the kids out of the house, and or, or vice versa, of course. <laughs> um, and and get get them, you know, get the kids breakfast and watch some football. Obviously, we're giving away a lot of things um, with these halftime draws, and, and obviously with the Real Sociedad fans that register. So, so yeah, seven o'clock is kickoff, but anywhere from quarter two, come down and, and we'll uh, we'll see you there. It's the, the best time to jump on board uh, the Rail Sociedad train because you, you'll go home with some merch. Uh, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll see you on Sunday. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. And with that, Rolls talking La Liga. Absolutely. And uh, with that, I think we'll, we'll end the show, George. But uh, people need to go on Eventbrite, search La Liga's race for the title. And we'll re- retweet it on FNR. And if you're listening to the podcast, it'll be in the podcast description as well, that link. So... Uh, Hopefully, I'll, I'll see people down there. I'll be trying to make an appearance. I've got my Doherty Cup duties in the afternoon. So but I can expect some new merch on you next week? <laughs> oh, it depends if I register in time, George. <laughs> uh, this has been State of Our Football Nation, and uh, we've had some great guests this evening. It has. It's been a joy from Georgia uh, right through to Eric, to Andy, and, of course, to Glenn Rolls. Thanks very much, mate. Catch you next week. You're listening to the State of Our Football Nation on FNR.